As you sit here meditating, it's important that you learn how to step back from your thoughts. You're giving yourself one thing to think about, the breath. And then you have to watch to see how well you're doing that. And if any other thought comes up, you have to be careful not to go into it. This habit we have of going into our thoughts. The Buddha calls that becoming. Something appears. It looks interesting. And there's a little world that goes along with that. And then you go into that world. And it can take you all kinds of places. As John Sawad used to say, our becomings are the things that we travel in. The world can be this human world right now, or it can be the world of the past, the world of the future, other levels of being, other places. But you have to make sure that while you're here, you don't go into those worlds. So you're stepping back from a process that you tend to do all the time. We go from one world to the next in the same way that you might hop from one train to another, to another, to another, end up in Saskatchewan. I wonder how you got there. But here you're trying to keep coming back, coming back, and developing this ability to step out of your worlds is going to be important. One, to keep, keep you with the breath so you don't get involved in other worlds. And then ultimately, as you establish this world, you hear with the breath. As it gets more comfortable, your sense of the body gets more expansive. The breath calms down. Sometimes you can even go into formless states. You're right here, but your sense of the body begins to dissolve. The boundary between the outside and the inside dissolves away. It's as if you just have a mist here, and then there are spaces between the mist, droplets. But whatever the state of concentration, eventually you're going to have to step back from the concentration too to start observing it. So it's good that you have this ability to step back, to observe thought processes simply as thought processes, and not get involved in the worlds. The Buddha said this is how you get past the process of becoming. So all the cravings he said that lead to suffering are the ones that lead to becoming. And that includes not only craving for sensuality and craving for becoming, even craving for non-becoming. In other words, you have a state of becoming and you want to see it destroyed. And that sense of you can gather around that desire for it to be destroyed, and that becomes a source of a new becoming too. So what are you going to do? We don't think about destroying any becomings you have. You think more about looking at the process. How does a becoming form? Even before there's a sense of I or me doing this in a particular world, there will be events in the mind. When we talk about them, they seem abstract, because we're so used to talking in terms of becoming. But it's really pretty simple. There's just events in the mind. And you can learn how to observe them from very early on. There are what are called the four precepts of purity, or the four virtues of purity. In other words, as you develop right action, right speech, right livelihood, you learn how to observe yourself. But these four precepts, or four virtues of purity, they elaborate on that a little bit. They start with the virtues of the precepts themselves. For the monks, it's the body mocha. For lay people, it's the five precepts. You learn how to observe yourself. This is the basic principle of, of insight. As the Buddha said, you see there are certain actions that you like to do, and they're going to give good results, so you do them, no problem. Certain actions you don't like to do, and you can see they give bad results, 
no problem. The problems are the actions you like to do but give bad results in the long term, or the ones that you don't like to do but give good results in the long term. And there, he says, you have to exert an effort. You have to learn how to talk to yourself. In other words, you have to pull out of your likes and dislikes. You see this with the precepts. You see this also with the second principle, which is restraint of the senses. When we think about restraint, the image that comes to mind immediately is that they're going to put a blindfold on you and they're going to put things over your ears so you can't hear. That's not the case. Think of restraining a horse. You don't blindfold the horse. You just notice if the horse is going off the path, you pull it back. If it's getting, going too fast, you pull it back a little bit. In other words, you think about what are the consequences of what it's doing going to be, and you want to make sure that it doesn't do something stupid. That's what restraint of the senses is. What we don't like to hear, though, is that some of the ways we engage with our senses of sight and hearing and so forth can be kind of stupid. But the process there is basically looking at, when you look at something, why? What's your purpose in looking? When you're listening, why? When you're smelling an aroma, when you're tasting a flavor, what are you going for? And for most of us, we're going just for the pleasure that comes out of these things. And we can elaborate a lot on that. That's what sensuality is all about. Sensuality is not the pleasures themselves, but it's the mind's ability to plan for these things, elaborate on them, to take delight in them, the commentaries that you run on the food you're eating, or the food that you used to eat, or the food that you're planning to eat. You can embroider these pleasures, because if you really look at them, there's not much there. Food tastes good only for a little while in your mouth, and then it's gone. It leaves you full for a little while, and then it's gone. And the actual pleasure and the actual contact itself is not much. And if our attitude is this, this is the only way we're going to find happiness in the world, okay, well, let's embroider it. Let's make it more than it really is. But the Buddha is reminding you there is another kind of happiness that goes beyond these things. And it gets obscured by the fact that you're getting fascinated with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, ideas. So given the fact that there is a greater pleasure, a greater happiness that comes from not clinging to these things, you begin to realize, okay, okay there's some drawbacks here. There are drawbacks to enjoying them. The pleasures can be there. As the Buddha said, even for awakened people, the things that are beautiful things that are beautiful are beautiful. The canon has poetry about the beauties of nature. Beauties of wild nature which is unusual back in those days. Most people, when they talked about the beauties of nature, would talk about domesticated nature. On the Pali Canon, it seems to be the oldest wilderness poetry we have. You even have Mahagasapa, who was one of the Buddha's strictest disciples, talking about the beauties of being out in the, in the mountains, surrounded by waterfalls and rivers forests, because it's a good place to get the mind to settle down. There are some pleasures that are really good for the practice. And how do you know? Well, you notice the effect that they have on your mind. Here again, we're looking at things in terms of cause and effect. Not so much at what you like and don't like, but where does this actually lead you? Where is it coming from in the mind? Where does it lead you? Same with the third principle, which is purity of livelihood. When you're making your livelihood, what impact does it have on your mind? Does your livelihood involve harming any beings? If so, it's going to have a bad impact. Does it involve aggravating your greed, aversion, and delusion? Okay, maybe you should look for another livelihood. But again, it's looking 
at what you're doing, the consequences, stepping back from what you're doing. Not saying, well, just because I've identified myself as someone who does this livelihood, I'm just going to stick with it. You pull back. So this is the role I've assumed. This is a good role for me. It's a question a lot of people are afraid to ask. They're afraid they're going to have to change their livelihood. But if they see they're actually doing harm, they're better off changing their livelihood. Then with the fourth principle of purity. which is reflecting on the requisites. In other words, when you eat, ask yourself, why am I eating? When you put on your clothing, what is purpose does this clothing serve? It would seem simple enough, but then you look at the way people actually buy clothing, what they buy it for. Usually it's more than just to protect the body. They've had a lot of other agendas going on. The same with food. Basically, the Buddha says, we eat so that we have enough strength to practice, to keep the body healthy. Anything more than that, we're eating for the, the flavor, eating for the, just for the fun of it. You have to remember, food comes with a price, and not just the monetary price. You think of all the suffering that people go through, even if they're providing you with vegan or vegetarian food, that people have to grow the food transport it, cook it, clean up. There's a lot of work that goes into this. And here we are, born into this world where we need food. Automatically placing a burden on others. So you want to make that burden as light as possible. Same with shelter. You need just enough shelter to protect you from the elements. Just enough medicine to make sure you stay healthy, your body can function. And that should be enough. Anything more than that, you're taking on more debts than you really need. So in each of these cases, you're just looking at your ordinary daily activities and you're beginning to see where in the mind these activities come from and what impact they have on the mind when you engage in them. That ability to step back is going to see you well, not only through concentration practice, but also in gaining insight. Remember the Buddha said he got onto the path by dividing his thoughts into two, two types. And it wasn't a question of whether he'd liked them or not. It was a question of where they came from in the mind, what mental attitude they came from, and also where they would lead, what kind of activities. And it would lead to activities that would harm themselves or harm other people, you'd have to say no. So it basically came down with the principles of right resolve. To resolve on renunciation, which is basically not feeding off of thoughts of sensuality, non-ill will and harmlessness. In other words, goodwill, compassion. Those should, should be his motive forces as he acted. That's what he decided. There's another passage where he talks about how he got started on the path, and this is a case where he realizes he needs to get the mind into concentration, and it's going to re involve putting aside sensuality again, thoughts of, that are fascinated with the pleasures of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. And as he said, his heart didn't leap up at the idea, but he stopped to consider if he could get past that fascination, his mind could settle down. Be a great sense of peace that would come from that sense of pleasure and even rapture that would come. Pleasure and rapture that were totally blameless. That didn't have to depend on things outside being a certain way. So in both cases, one it was a matter of stepping back and watching his mind from the outside to see the pattern of cause and effect. And then secondly, the number one issue is going to be sensuality to begin with. It was because he was able to step back that he was able to get over the mind's resistance to settling down in something that had no involvement with sensuality at all, but would give a sense of well-being. 
It's not like we're here depriving ourselves all the time. The Jains used to accuse the Buddhist monks of being sen sensualists because they were enjoying the, sensual, the pleasure of jhana. Well, they were enjoying it, but it's not a sensual pleasure. Even though you're filling the body with good energy, there can be a strong sense of rapture. It doesn't count as a sensual pleasure, it's a pleasure of form. And that doesn't have the drawbacks of sensuality. So this ability to step back and watch cause and effect in your mind, in terms of your actions. That's what allows you to get into concentration. The same with the discernment. You can step back from your concentration and begin to see the things that go into making it up. This is where you get into dependent core arising. We look at the list and it seems awfully abstract, but it's actually something very near to what's going on right in our present awareness. You see this clearly when you're looking at your concentration. First factor after ignorance is fabrication. Bodily fabrication, which is the in and out breath. Verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation, how you're talking to yourself. Mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions. Feelings are feeling tones, pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Perceptions are the images you hold in mind. You've got these things right here as you're meditating. You're focused on the breath. You're talking to yourself about the breath. You have images that you hold in mind about how the breath flows through the body. And of course, they're the feeling tones. In fact, the feeling tones are how the states of jhana are defined. That's just one of the links, one of the more important links. But you learn how to see your own mind just in terms of cause and effect. And you realize that thoughts can come into the mind and you don't have to build a sense of you around them. You don't have to build a sense of the world around them. Just look, cause and effect. What happens as a result? Where do they come from? Where do they lead? And you learn this talent through the precepts. Or even further back, you learn this talent as you begin to observe yourself as you were giving a gift and ask the question, what kind of gift can I give that gives rise to the greatest sense of well-being? You began to notice there were certain attitudes you would bring to a gift that were better than others. Your choice of a gift, your choice of who to give the gift to, how you talked about it to yourself beforehand, during, after. We're basically here to observe ourselves in action. And this is a principle that applies all the way through. So as you go through the day, and exercise a little restraint over your senses. Remind yourself, okay, this is an important skill you need to develop. The Buddha is not trying to be a killjoy and tell you not to enjoy the pleasures of the senses. There are pleasures there that are perfectly innocent, that don't have a bad impact on the mind at all. It's the ones where you constantly talk to yourself about them. Those are the ones you've got to watch out for. And as you're exercising restraint over the senses, this is where it's also good to have a good solid basis with the breath. Because a lot of our desire to go running after the pleasures of the senses is because we feel empty inside. We want somebody to fill up the emptiness. Or as you have the sense of the breath filling the body, comfortable, at ease, refreshing. You don't feel so pulled into inner conversations about pleasures outside. You can learn how to step back from them. So largely it's a matter of where you're going to look for your happiness. And it was basically saying, because there is this higher happiness, look in the Third Noble Truth. If you let go of your passion, you let go of your craving, he you said it leads to the ultimate happiness. So there's that ultimate happiness that's promised. If we didn't have that promise, you'd have to say, well, whatever pleasures I can get, I'll just go for them, because that's all there is. But that's not all there is. That's what the message of the Four Noble Truths is all about. There is an ultimate happiness. And we can get there by learning how to observe ourselves in action. 
letting go of the pleasures that get in the way of the higher ones. So when you're exercising restraint over the senses, when you're observing the precepts, when you're being careful about your livelihood, when you reflect on your requisites and take only what you need, don't think of it as a deprivation. You're making a trade. You're trading up. But it does require that you pull back and watch. Learn to see things in terms of cause and effect. And that's how you get past the, the causes of suffering. And the mind can open up to something more than you can imagine.